and welcome to St. Anne's Ride Anglican Church uh, video, service video for Sunday the 14th of June. Uh, my name is Greg Burke and uh, I work on the ministry team, the staff team at St. Anne's. It's my privilege to welcome you. Uh, we're so glad you could join us and we hope that uh, your time with us today will be encouraging uh, and challenging and uh, we'll give you uh, some food for thought as you seek to live uh, in honour and response to Jesus. In our service today, we're going to continue our series of sermons on the Apostle Paul's letter to the Ephesian church. Uh, Steph is going to help us to reflect on the sufficiency and the love of Christ from Ephesians chapter 3. We're also going to meet a member of our 8 o'clock congregation, uh, Chris, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from her. The writer of uh, the letter to the Hebrews encourages us to respond to God's kindness in these terms. He writes, Through Jesus, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Well, as we begin our service today, let's pray and ask for God's help. To do this. We pray together. Thank you, Father, for making yourself known to us and showing us the way of salvation through faith in your Son. Please teach and encourage us through your word so that we may be ready to serve you for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first song reminds us that Jesus has paid the ultimate price to redeem his people, his own life given in sacrifice for us. The song is, My worth is not in what I own. Uh, you might care to just listen or uh, sing along as the words come up on the screen. My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or name, in win or lose. But in the blood of Christ that flowed at the cross I rejoice in my Redeemer Greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul I will trust in Him no other My soul is satisfied in As summer flowers we fade and die Fame, youth and beauty hurry by But life eternal calls to us at the cross I will not boast in wealth or might Human wisdom's fleeting light But I will boast in knowing Christ At the cross I rejoice in my Redeemer Greatest treasure Wellspring of my soul I will trust in soul is satisfied in him alone two wonders here that I confess my worth and my unworthiness my value fixed my ransom paid I 
Christ is my Redeemer, greatest treasure, the wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. Friends, Jesus is not distant and unmoved by our struggles. He knows us and he opens the way for us to come back to God. So again, the writer of Hebrews says, Jesus, the son of God, has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Mercy and grace to help us. Let's uh, join together as we pray this confession prayer, begging for God's mercy and asking for grace. We pray. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have gone our own way and broken your laws. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us, and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you more and more. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Listen now to the comforting words of Psalm 103. This psalm speaks of the love and the faithfulness and the mercy of God his compassion that he shows throughout all generations to his children. Janine is going to read Psalm 103. Psalm 103 of David. Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbour his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works, everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, my soul. Well, friends, these are troubled times, aren't they? I interviewed uh, Chris during the week. And I was particularly interested in her insights into the relationship between Christian faith 
and politics. Let's meet Chris now. Well, Chris, thanks very much for agreeing to be interviewed um, for our service video. Uh, I wanted to ask you a couple of things. Firstly, um, about your just tell us something a little bit about your family and about your professional life. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm married to Rob, and I, we have two children. They've got all grown up now. Um, and I was a high school teacher for uh, 20 years. I taught English and history, and then I did a kind of bizarre. Um, U-turn and went and worked in the Australian Taxation Office for 20 years. It was a real barbecue stopper, that one. Um, and in the tax office, I was an HR director and I worked with senior managers on their leadership. I was a leadership coach. And both those jobs were just amazing and I'm so grateful that I had those opportunities. It was terrific. What was the link between, like, how did you get from teaching did your teaching training help you in that job? Or was that, it just... that is a really good question. Um, it was Rob's fault, actually, because he said to me, you're, you're, you're burning out and you, you can't give enough attention to our children. Um, and he was right. And so we thought uh, a stint in the public service where it was nine to five and, you know, very regular and it would be fine. And it didn't work out that way at all. Um, I got into the public service because uh, I had people who gave me good advice about my application. But what I realised, and I didn't think I had the skills or anything like that, but what I realised is that teachers are problem solvers. They are trained in problem solving. Either they're trained in university or they're trained by life. Um, and they solve problems. And that really set me up for working in the public service because all you run up against are problems and you have to think creatively about how to solve them. So, yes, teaching did prepare me for public service life. Right. So um, how did you come to Christian faith? Were you born into sort of a Christian family or was it different to that? Well, um, it, I didn't become a Christian suddenly. Uh, I was brought up a Presbyterian. Uh, Rob's an Anglican, so when we get, got married, I got converted. Um, and we went to church every Sunday. Uh, sometimes we went to church twice on Sunday. Uh, when I was 16, I went to one of those evangelical rallies where you make a decision and you go forward, as they, as they used to do in those days, and I did. It was more of an organic thing. Like, I've never been out of the Christian culture in that sense, so I came to it gradually during my early life, and I've always been a Christian. That's not to say that I haven't had really difficult periods in my life where things have been, I've had a lot of doubt, I've had periods of dryness, um, and I've had issues particularly with um, some of the things that the Christian church does at some times, which I've found very difficult to deal with, um, and it's made me made my, I found witnessing for Jesus difficult in those periods. Um, but, the, for example, the last five years have been a great blessing because when we landed at St Anne's, um, I found the teaching at St Anne's really has helped my Christian faith because the way you teach, Greg, you and, and the other preachers teach, it, it's very honest, it's very transparent, and you don't dodge the hard questions. And I found that incredibly encouraging. And nobody paid me for that um, that advertisement, but that's what I really think. What I, what I have learned about faith is um, to hang on to Jesus. That's it. You just hang on to Jesus with all your might when it gets difficult. And sometimes you might feel that you're just hanging on with your fingertips, but you just hang on to Jesus because uh, he's what it's all about and a lot of the other stuff is just noise. Um, so he helps me make sense of the world when I can't make sense of it myself. And I try to keep the focus now where it belongs. So it sounds like there's been some times when that's been a struggle. Yeah. I think it, it's different for everybody, uh, but I have been helped by reading 
uh, that other Christians have been through periods of dryness and struggle, and that's been incredi incredibly encouraging. Um, I think it's very important for Christians to engage with the outside world, and when you do that, you take on some of the difficulties that the outside world is having, and it can have a flow-on effect to you, and it can challenge your faith in very deep ways. And but Jesus, it's always there. Um, you just if you if you get too far away from Jesus, you're in real trouble. But he his example and his teachings always ground you. So, and and uh, that's how I've learned to cope. It's been great. So, Chris, um, you say Christians should engage with the world. Um, what sort of community involvement have you got now? Like, what are you doing engaging with the world? Um, I've always been a bit of a vol volunteer in my life. Um, things like Amnesty International, Nursing Mothers Association, things like that. At the moment, I've just finished a long stint on a school council out for a western suburb school. Um, I am... I'm involved in a local community group here at um, in Canada Bay and I'm their representative on a council committee, an advisory committee. Uh, we work on the environment in Canada Bay and also I'm doing, I'm a volunteer reader at radio station 2RPH which is uh, a radio station in Sydney that provides um, print services for people who can't access printed media. We, we read the news, we read magazine articles, we read books, that kind of thing, over the air. Yeah, so that, that's at the moment. And you've had a bit of a change in reading material. What are you reading for them now? Well, it's really exciting because I've been, um, cause I'm quite new to it. For the last couple of months I've been reading news articles and you have to read it in a neutral tone. So whether you agree with it or not, you have to read it very neutrally. So that's been a challenge for a Christian in some ways. Um, but... I'm now getting a bit of, I think it's a, regarded as a bit of a, uh, elevated experience. Um, the reader who does the New Yorker regularly is moving to Canberra. So, uh, I get, I think I, I'm going to be able to read the New Yorker in coming months. And I am so excited about that because I've been a New Yorker fan ever since my son paid for my first uh, subscription about 15 years ago. So yes, very excited. Our next song reminds us that God's grace is more than sufficient for each one of us, no matter what our situation, no matter what our need. The song is Grace Awaiting Thee.
Jackie is now going to read to us from Ephesians 3 and then Steph will teach us from this passage. Um, as we look together at the Bible, uh, let's ask God to use his word to challenge and equip us. Let's pray together before we look at God's word. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for inspiring all scripture by the Holy Spirit. Help us as we hear your holy word to be equipped for every good work. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. In some good news this week, the Department of Education has given the go-ahead for SRE to resume in schools during Term 3. I'm keen to be seeing my kiddie class again. We'd been learning about how much God loves them. To show them how much, I'd ask them if God loved them this much, or this much, or this much, or this much, or even more. And we'd go until our arms were all around our bodies in a hug. Our memory verse told us that God's love reaches higher than the heavens. We would then try and stand as tall as possible, trying to reach as high in the sky as we could. That right there could be a scripture lesson on verse 18 and 19 of today's passage. The love of Jesus is so much bigger than we can truly know. It is so wide and long and high and deep, and it surpasses knowledge. What a description! A love that is so big that is beyond knowability, if that is even a word. Paul wants the Ephesians and anyone reading this letter to truly understand how much they are loved. His prayer is centered on this beautiful desire that as both individuals and a church, people are able to know this love and to not just know it, but to be filled with it. This is not a limiting prayer, it's a bold prayer, it's vast. Paul isn't praying for small things here. He isn't hedging his bets by asking that just one person knows it, but rather a whole group of people. And we kind of started in the middle of the passage for today, so let's just go back to the beginning of Paul's prayer now. Verse 14 is a bit of an odd verse, and it seems kind of out of place. What is the reason that Paul is, that is making Paul kneel on the ground and pray? Well, we need to look back in Ephesians to find it. 
Last week, Katie spoke to us about the first half of Ephesians 3. In the first verse, you can see this long dash at the end. Then verse 2 to 13 is a side thought to the previous section. Paul has taken a sidebar. It seems he had enough of thought that he couldn't leave out. So verse 2 to 13 is essentially him having a side thought, a sidebar. You can see verse 1 in chapter 3 starts the same as verse 14. For this reason, Paul's right. Well, what reason, Paul? It's because the unity between Jews and Gentiles. No longer they separated, people divided by their wall of hostility, but now they are united in and through Christ. It is for this reason that Paul kneels down and prays to God the Father, from all families, both Jews and Gentiles, receive their names. Paul is once again establishing that Jews and Gentiles are now together in a new humanity. Together, if they trace their family lines back on Ancestry.com, which I'm sure they could because it's you know common knowledge that they had access to the internet in 21st century Ephesus. No, it isn't. To borrow a line from Greg, that was a, that was a joke. But if they did, they could trace themselves all the way back to the Garden of Eden and the creation of humanity. Together, they stand as children of God, and Paul is praying about them all. He says it again in verse 18. Together with all the Lord's holy people, he is praying for this church, a church, a church filled with Christian Gentiles and Jews, and praying for them collectively. He spent a lot of time in his letter to the Ephesians, talking about the theology of why and how Jews and Gentiles are now united. And here in his prayer, he's putting it into practice. His theology is reflected in his prayer. It's not like a politician who speaks empty words at length and then holds, and then behind closed doors does the complete opposite or holds a Bible up, upside down. He's praying with great love for the church in Ephesus to be united as one. Though it seems he's under no illusions that combining two groups of people together is easy. He prays that they may have strength. He prays for them in their weakness to feel the strength of God, to their innermost being, for them to be rooted, deeply rooted in the love of God. Be a deeply rooted tree that can hold out in a storm, to be a church established in love a church rooted in the love of Christ, not, be, not to be a church marked by hypocrisy, by hate and jealousy, but by being a church who through the strength of the Spirit is showing love to each other as a reflection of Jesus' love for us. That famous verse, 1 John 4 verse 19, we love because he first loved us. This love that is higher than the heavens, that surpasses knowledge. Which, by the way, doesn't mean that it's unknowable. Just that there's always going to be more than we think, more than we can know. Paul is praying for the church in Ephesus to be filled with this love. In chapter 1, he prayed that their eyes would be opened to the love of God. And they're going to need that. There's nothing quite like making two groups of people who aren't so fond of each other to hang out. Paul isn't delusional. He isn't expecting it to be simple. It's not just a blase, love each other. I mean, how can you love each other when you don't even like each other? That's a really hard question. How can I love someone who's not like me? How can I love someone with a difference of opinion or a different skin color? Christians have a bad reputation when it comes to love. There are Christians right now in America whose racism is rightly being called out. Christians who didn't want to be in isolation because they thought they'd have to sacrifice a small amount of their freedom to love their vulnerable neighbor, and they didn't want to do that. Christians who went on crusades which killed thousands of people, supposedly for the love of God, in the name of God, people calling themselves Christians have murdered and raped. 
behind the love of God, so-called Christians have abused children. This is our reality, a real and painful reality. I would really recommend the documentary For the Love of God. It looks at the good and the bad that Christians and the church have done throughout history. Our history is filled with big and small things that are bad, yet it's also filled with good things. The abolition of slavery, hiding Jews from Nazis, dropping a meal around for a new mum and dad. Big and small things, good and bad. What a shame that our failure to express love to those around us gives Jesus a bad name. What a shame that Christians' hostility to people have built up walls that hinder the gospel. What a shame that when we aren't rooted in the love of Christ, that sacrificial and boundless love of Jesus, we fail. Paul prays in verse 21 for God to be the glory in the church. And what a high view and expectation of the church. Is that something that we're praying for? Are we praying for the church as a whole, for it to respond with Christ-like love? Are we praying with thankfulness when the church does respond well to an issue? No church is perfect. Church is wonderfully messy. Churches are full of people from all walks of life, of people who are loved by God. And we have a responsibility as Christians to be generous and loving in the way we treat people. But sometimes that can be hard. Sometimes it can be hard to feel to find that gold in people. It's so easy to point out flaws, to hold a grudge, and to think less of someone we don't get along with, which makes the need to be loving to those around us even more important. Our actions reflect back on Jesus for the good and the bad of it, depending on how much or how little we love each other as a church and those outside of it too. There are a lot of practical ways to love each other, but one that is slightly less talked about is our attitude to people in our prayers. When we're praying, are we praying only for our shopping list of prayers, or are we praying for God to work in our hearts, to give us the strength to love, for God to help us to be rooted and established in love, for our community to have Christ dwell in our hearts? for the church and those outside to understand how deep the love of Christ is. Because let's be honest, we need Jesus to help us to love. It's hard to love, and to love like Jesus comes at a cost. And it's so much easier and convenient to love like we want to, to be selfish and judgmental, to treat church and those in our community as a convenience. And at the moment, as we meet together as a church online, it is so wonderfully convenient. I can tune in whenever I want. Personally, I am loving that I can wear my pyjamas to church with a cup of coffee. It's been quite a refreshing experience in many ways. And so it's going to be a shock to the system when we go back to life as before. I'll need to get dressed. I'll need to get somewhere on time. I'll need to talk to people which, if you're an introvert, is not always an easy thing. At home, church is just me, my dog, and a pre-recorded video. Not much is expected of me. I can do church whenever I want, if I even want to. Church has become less about the people around me. That might not be your experience of church at the moment, but I have a feeling it's probably more common than we want to think. Going back to church is going to involve a lot of prayer. It will be that shock to the system, and it will be dependent on the safety to do it. But I am excited for it to happen. I'm so looking forward to being able to be in a community of Christians again. I'm so looking forward to being inconvenienced, which I gotta say feels like an odd thing. Looking forward to being inconvenienced. That's something that, as Christians, our lives should display. Christ-like love, that sacrificial love, it is, for the most part, inconvenient for what we want in our own lives. 
It is an attitude that we need to have to be able to be ready to put aside what is convenient and easy. What does it look like for Christ to dwell in our hearts by faith? What does it look like for a ch- to What does it look like for a church to pray that for each other? What does it look like for a group of people to understand how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ? To be a church displaying the fruit of the spirit, to be a church that bears with one another in love, to be a church who places the needs of others as important, to love our neighbour. Well, that's not something that's going to happen overnight, is it? It's hard work. When people think and act differently than we do, our immediate response is not always to try and be understanding. That is why we need to pray for each other to find strength in God to love to work hard at being rooted in Christ's love and to be willing to take a hard look at ourselves and be willing to change. But change is hard. But most importantly, it is possible. Sometimes people can change and God is able to do so much more than we are, so much more than we can ask or imagine. God is able to work within us to change. And what a wonderful thing that is. And we can be thankful for that change that has already happened in our lives. God is already at work in you. He's helping you at this moment to know his love, to be rooted and established in it. He's working to strengthen you to your innermost being. You are loved by him more than you know. And as Christians, we want others to know this boundless and multidimensional love. Because God's love isn't this big or this big or even this big, it's so much more than that. You need to be like Paul and pray this bold prayer, which we're going to do now. I'm going to finish this sermon by praying the passage of today. So I'd like and I'd love for you to join me as I pray. I'm going to start from verse 16. I pray that out of his glorious riches, He may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know that this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Also will now lead us in prayer for our community and for our world. And after that, um, We'll share in the Lord's Prayer. Today, we will start our time of prayer by reflecting on what King David wrote in the beginning of Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fail. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, we bring our thoughts to you in prayer. We thank you that you have made us your children through the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ, and that we now belong to your people and can speak to you freely. Lord, during these crazy times, we thank you for the privilege it is to live in Australia, where first and foremost our freedom of religion allows us to worship you freely and openly. We pray for all of your people, especially for those who live in countries where following you is not as easy as it is here. Instill in us, Lord, a keen heart for those in countries in the world where the trouble continues well beyond the headlines of our news. As restrictions due to COVID-19 are easing here in Australia and around the world, 
We pray that people will continue to be careful in their interactions with others and mindful of those in more challenging circumstances. We pray, Heavenly Father, that leaders in countries where the COVID-19 cases are still on the rise, out of control as it, as it seems, to show strong and wise judgment in their decision making. Lord, we pray for the volatile situation in the U.S. and in many other countries following the police brutality leading to the killing of George Floyd. Please keep those who wish to express their sympathy for the Black Lives Matter movement safe and level-headed so that the violence and destruction may cease. We pray for the involvement of our church, both nationally and internationally, as we pray for our link missionaries and for organizations that reaches well outside our borders, such as TIA, and Anglican aid. We ask that you will give those willing to look beyond their own troubles strength, courage and perseverance as they work to spread the good news to the people around them. We pray today for Helen and Wayne Mayhew and for Cal Caleb, Evie and Benjamin in Ethiopia. We pray especially for the many people in Ethiopia who are particularly vulnerable to the COVID-19 virus and may not be able to afford or be able to access appropriate health care and who live in housing situations where hygiene may be severely lacking. We pray for the Mayhews that you give them extra strength as the current travel situation may result in their planned home assignment not being possible to happen. We pray for the doulas that Helen have been working with, that they will continue to show Jesus' love to the women in need that they interact with and can support them well with the many challenges they face. We pray, Lord, for wisdom and guidance for Helen, how to best support the doulas in their role. Closer to home, Lord, we pray for our church, for all of our congregations and for other Christian churches around us as restrictions for church services are being lifted. We pray for wisdom into how in how to best facilitate this and how to ensure that people feel truly included. We thank you for all the work our church staff and other volunteers have done during these past few months. And we pray, Lord, for all those who are made, may have tuned in to the online version of the St. Anne service. We pray that people may continue to find hope and strength in spite of the lack of social interaction. Lord, for all of us, I pray that as we face a new week tomorrow, we will put on your armour and that you may make us bold and give us the courage needed to speak boldly about you to the people that we come in contact with. In Jesus' name, Amen. We pray our family prayer, the Lord's Prayer, together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And I wonder if you would now uh, join with me in this prayer of thanksgiving. And after that, we'll express our thankfulness to God in song. We pray together. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we humbly thank you for all your gifts so freely given, for life and health and safety, for work and rest and friendship, and for the wonder of creation. Above all, we praise you for our Saviour, Jesus Christ, for his death and resurrection, for your life-giving spirit, and the hope of sharing in your glory. Fill our hearts with all joy and peace in believing, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Well, again, uh, friends, a very special welcome to you, uh, especially if you're visiting us for the first time or perhaps you're reconnecting with St. Anne's. Uh, either way, we'd love to chat with you and to give you a chance to find out a little bit more about St. Anne's and our people. We have a special Zoom meeting set up each Sunday during uh, June, the month of June, uh, 5 o'clock Sydney time, these meetings will be available. If you'd like to connect with us in this way, uh, just enter the meeting number that's on the screen now into the uh, Zoom app or the website. Uh, this slide actually will come up again at the end of our service, so you can uh, make a note of the meeting number, but you'd be most welcome. Uh, also, uh, at the end of the service, our contact details and website details will come up. You may wish to contact us uh, by phone or email or through our website. Uh, if we can be of any assistance to you, we'd love to do that. Uh, regular members, uh, thank you uh, too. It's uh, great to have you uh, joining us today. And I want to thank you especially uh, uh, for your continued financial support of gospel ministry here and around the world through your offerings. Uh, we've been very encouraged uh, by your continued uh, support. Uh, during the COVID-19 uh, shutdown, jigsaw puzzles have become very popular. In fact, uh, jigsaw puzzles were one of those things like uh, toilet paper and uh, pasta, which uh, sold out, uh, along with webcams and other things, actually. Uh, here's an example of the high standard that is possible with proper attention uh, to a complicated jigsaw. Uh, another thing that is popular is the community choir. And someone sent me this photo of their local choir, and the good news is there's not a corona in sight. Well, thanks to everyone who has responded to our survey. Uh, it seems, however, there's a limit of only 40 responders allowed uh, in the app we were using. And so our newsletter sets out an alternative way for you to respond. So if you haven't used the survey online, uh, please just check your newsletter and fill out the survey there and get that back to us. That will really help us with our planning as we uh, as we're working out how we can resume face-to-face -face church meetings uh, in July. Uh, please pray about that. It is rather complex, but we are making progress. And the more information we have uh, about people who are coming, the better. So thank you very much. Um, this week, we are providing another thank you lunch uh, or a thank you lunch for the staff of another local school where we teach SRE or scripture. Uh, this is a bigger school. It'll be uh, a pretty... A big, a big lunch to provide, and we're looking forward to that. The good news is that uh, Race is uh, back teaching SRE at our local high school. At least uh, Ashley is back teaching in that school three days a week, and uh, we're hoping to resume SRE lessons for infants and primary students sometime next term. That will depend on um, the government and the Department of Education, and that'll be something to pray about. Those of us who are teaching uh, scripture, we're, we're missing our kids, our classes. It's a fantastic opportunity to help them to learn about the faith, the Christian faith that their parents have um, uh, chosen that they learn about. We're looking forward to the resumption of those lessons. Uh, please check your newsletter for our Zoom catch-up opportunities. Uh, it is a good chance just uh, after uh, our 10 o'clock, uh, after a 10 o'clock service time at 11 o'clock or again at 7 o'clock in the evening on Sundays, we've got Zoom catch-up meetings. It'd be great if you could uh, just check in and say hello to a few people. Uh, even though this is done via the internet, it is a really worthwhile thing to do. Now, our video today will uh, finish with a repeat of our virtual choir song, Oh, the Deep, Deep Love of Jesus. We showed that last week and had some, uh, some good and po very positive feedback. So we thought we'd repeat it again this week. Uh, our virtual choir has uh, begun work on their next effort. I'm looking forward to that. Well, uh, let's dedicate ourselves now to serve the living God and then to uh, we're going to pray for each other in the words of the grace. We pray this prayer of dedication. Loving God, we thank you for hearing our prayers, feeding us with your word and encouraging us today. Take us and use us to love and serve you and all people in the power of your spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let me pray the grace for each other. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, 
be with us all evermore. Amen. Well, friends, uh, again, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, please enjoy uh, this song. Uh, we hope it's encouraging for you. And we look forward to uh, seeing you again next week. Thank you. Cheers. deep, deep love of Jesus, vast, unmeasured, boundless, free, rolling as a mighty ocean in its fullness over me. Underneath me, all around me, is the current of your love, leading onward leading homeward to your glorious rest above Oh the deep, deep love All I need and trust Is the deep, deep love of Jesus Spread his praise from shore to shore How he came to pay a ransom Through the saving cross he bore How he watches for his loved ones Those he died to make his own How for them he's interceding Leading now Surpassing all the rest It's an ocean full of blessing In the midst of every test Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus Mighty Savior, precious friend You will bring us full to glory Where your love will Deep, deep love, all I need and trust is the deep, deep love of Jesus. All the deep, deep love, all I need and trust is the deep.
Jesus.